might have been 12 or 13 years old, and I remember very well, my dad came home one day from work, and he was upset. I could tell because the color of his face. And it turned out on that day, what happened was that environmental protester, protesters uh, started to block train tracks leading to and from nuclear power plants. And my dad was a director of such a power plant, and he became concerned about the future of energy generation in that country. So he started to say things like, uh, what the heck are they thinking? Uh, do they really think electricity comes out of the, the socket? And if that continues, then we will have uh, to freeze next winter. And I just thought, hmm, that would be actually kind of cool if our home doesn't need any electricity to stay warm. He responded something like bogus. But later on, after he calmed down, we started to discuss this topic a little bit more intensely, and over the years, quite a bit more. I didn't realize it at the time, but it did influence my professional career quite profoundly. So what if we would be able to build buildings much more energy efficient than we do? Just imagine you could heat your kid's bedroom on the coldest day in the winter with only two candles. Well, I'm not saying that this is literally what you should do, but you get the point. It's all about energy efficiency. We call this a passive house. And if you do this, now you're actually much more environmentally friendly. To become more environmentally friendly, we can do two different things. We can use renewable energy and materials, or we can reduce our energy uh, consumption drastically. To use renewable energies is actually not really a new thought. In fact, it's very old. 2,500 years ago, the Greeks were facing a severe fuel shortage in Prienne due to deforestation. And I always thought we Canadians invented clear-cutting, but no, the Greeks were first. And what they did back then, they optimized their city planning in a way that each and every building could be optimized to face the winter sun and the people would stay warm. So this is one of the very first documented examples where city planning was paying attention to renewable energy. Another extreme example is the Fram, a boat which was modified by Norwegian explorers in the 1890s to search for the North Pole. And what they've done, they added about 40 centimeter of tarred fell for thermal insulation to the boat, triple pane glazing and some sort of ventilation device. And they have been successful in a sense that they stayed three years out in the Arctic searching for the North Pole. Well, they didn't find it. But they have proven that with consequent energy conservation, you actually can travel quite a bit further. So in human history, our fossil fuel consumption is actually a very short period. You can call it the fossil fart. Everything before, for thousands of years, we consumed solar energy, hydro, or wind, or even just burned some wood to stay warm. Right now, we are somewhere at the top of this curve. And we know, mainly for environmental reasons, that we have to change things and enter into the second solar age. And one thing which would be really helpful in this transition would be to become more energy efficient, consuming less. Energy efficiency will change the, de the design. That has been true for cars, and it will be also certainly true for buildings. We've overcome that sentimental notion to cling to old-fashioned ways of transportation. We have to overcome the same problem with the way how we build our buildings. And also the way how the, the cars are constructed are vastly different from 100 years ago. But the way how we build today is maybe not that different, at least not in North America. So, because of this, the World Economic Forum has published a report a few years back focusing on the, uh, the labor productivity of all kinds of different industries. And they came up with that over the last 50 years, the labor productivity in the US was increased by about 150%. So what that means is that one hour of labor is pr uh, producing 150% more today than it was 50 years ago. But what did the construction industry do? Did they behave the same way? Yeah, no, not quite. They went down by 19%, a decline of productivity. And when you read the report, you will find reasons such as a lack of, opt uh, of process optimization, a lack of know-how transfer, 
and a lack of using modern technologies. To understand what that means, we have to go a little bit further back, looking at the industrial revolutions, plural. The first one you're all familiar with, that was the mechanization, that was the conversion from steam to power, train, steam engines, those kind of things. The second one was the invention of assembly lines, where you start mass production and the electrification. The third one was the implementation of computers and robots in modern manufacturing, the automation. The third, that's the one we're in right now, cyber-physical systems, essentially the communication with everything. But where's the construction industry? You might find components mass-produced. You might even find components using some robots to manufacture. But the buildings themselves, that part of the industry got somewhere stuck between the first and second industrial revolution. So if we look at a construction site about 150 years ago, somewhere in North America, and compare that with a modern construction site today, the difference becomes very apparent right away. 150 years ago, everything was black and white. Today, it's in color. <laughs> Beside that, not too much. OK, hard heads. Yes, we have nailing guns, but that's pretty much the biggest innovation. Otherwise, we're literally building the same way as we've done it 100, 150 years ago. So professionally speaking, I grew up in an environment in Central Europe where wood construction was, well, at least since decades, done with prefabrication. So I didn't experience construction on site. Until I moved to Vancouver 12 years ago, and I was walking through the streets, and started to notice that each and every construction, no matter what the size of the building was, was done on site. So I stopped by and asked these people, well, you know, why is it that you do on-site construction? Why don't you do prefabrication? And I always got the same answer, no, this is way too expensive. We can't afford this. Hmm, okay. Next time I traveled back to Austria, I asked my former colleagues and asked them, well, why is it actually that you do prefabrication? Why don't you frame on site? Why don't you build on site? And I got a surprising answer. No, this is way too expensive. We can't afford that. <laughs> it took me a while to wrap my head around this because I had to assume that both have pretty good reasons to do what they're doing. And it took me actually quite a few years to get finally the answer. And that's what I'm going to share with you over the next few minutes. The first and most important step to understand the answer is thermal insulation. We humans, at least in the Western world, we constantly surround ourselves with three skins. The first is our actual skin, marvelous organ, keeps our body temperature stable at all times. The, th the second skin are our clothes. We can adapt them depending on our level of activity and the climate, etc., to stay comfortable. The third skin are all our buildings. So, coming back to the clothes. If you're getting cold, you might want to put on a sweater, something like this, maybe different color. But. So, and when you're staying inside, that works re really well. As soon as you go outside, you will figure out pretty quick it's not going to work that well anymore. The reason is because wind starts to infiltrate in your insulation layer and makes it pretty much useless. So what you will do instead is you will put on a functional jacket, something like this. This is now airtight. It safeguards your insulation layer, keeps you comfortable and warm. In addition, it's even watertight, so it keeps you dry when it rains. And to top this even further, it can handle your excess moisture, your sweat. So you basically stay comfortable, warm and dry pretty much at all times. This is exactly how we should build our buildings. But there's more to it. This is a thermographic picture of an old-fashioned coffee machine and a thermos flask. We heated up some water to about 70 degrees, poured it in the both, you know, both systems, let it sit for a couple of hours, measured the temperature again, and it was virtually identical. But one system has consumed a lot of energy to maintain that interior climate. The other one didn't consume anything. So it's about insulation, it's about compact architecture, and it's about the absence of thermal bridges. Thermal bridges are part of your building where you transfer heat usually from the in to the outside. Could be the other way around as well. To understand that better, let's take a look at an old-fashioned motorcycle engine. 
you have a combustion chamber or two, and inside this chamber it's very hot. If you wouldn't do anything, the engine would overheat, would fail, it's not going to work. So engineers came up with the genius idea to have these cooling rims or cooling uh, fins around it to transfer heat from the inside to the outside, and then wind can take away the excess energy and everything works fine. That's great, but unfortunately, we are doing the same thing with our buildings. But now we have the opposite effect. We are trying to heat them in the winter time, but we have these cooling fins, maybe not in steel, but steel reinforced concrete, and we're constantly transferring the heat from the, out, uh, from the inside to the outside, so extremely inefficient. Another important component are the windows. We should start to realize that windows are perfect passive solar thermal collectors. What that means is, if you have the right kind of quality, triple pin glazing usually, at least in moderate and cold climate zones, insulated frames and the right orientation, your window can harvest more energy on cold winter days from the sun than it's going to lose throughout the night time. So that helps to mitigate or to reduce your energy consumption drastically. And it does this whole thing passively. No gadgets, no controls, no fans, no pumps. We do these things because we want to reduce our, en our energy consumption drastically because we want to get down to the two candles. And there's another reason why we do this, because we know that 39% of the global energy-related CO2 emissions are caused by buildings. That's a very big chunk of the pie, and we could reduce that drastically. So this was all about the, um, the operational energy. Now let's focus for a moment on the um, embodied energy. The embodied energy is the energy we're going to use for manufacturing materials or manufacturing buildings. And one important material comes to mind right away, this is wood. Wood is one of the very few renewable construction materials. You can reuse and recycle steel, concrete and others, but they're not renewable. And wood has one further advantage, all the other materials usually are emitting a lot of CO2 when they get manufactured. With wood, it's the opposite. Wood can actually harvest CO2 and sequesters carbon in its fibers. So one cubic meter of wood has filtered about one ton of CO2 and has stored about 270 kilogram of carbon in its fibers. So coming back to my favorite picture, we can and we should continue to build with wood, but we have to change the methods on how we do it, mainly because of two reasons. The first one is we want to be more environmentally friendly, and the second one is we would like to be able to build taller and larger buildings out of wood. To become more environmentally friendly, we know already wood is a perfect material to do so. But we also know that we have to increase the thickness of insulation to reduce our energy consumption. And if we look at a whole bunch of other countries where the building codes are demanding fairly high levels of energy efficiency, we can see that the insulation is somewhere between 25, 35, 40 centimeter thickness. So now if you ask these guys on site, they're used to build two by six stud walls. For the rest of the world, that's 14 centimeter. So if you use those stud walls, that's not remotely enough to get down to the two candles. So you would have to start to increase the thickness. If you ask them to do that with a 2x8, yeah, they probably give you the looks. If you ask them to do that with a 2x10 or 2x12, they probably will give you the finger. It's not going to happen. It's too heavy. So you will need a crane. But cranes are expensive. If you have a crane, you want to keep it very short on the building site. The logical next step is go for prefabrication. You build your walls and all other components in a controlled environment on large tables. You can um, get air tightness, thermal bridges, everything under control. You can build much thicker walls. And all of this in a controlled environment optimized from an ergonomic point of view. So your productivity skyrockets. Now you ship those panels to the building site. You're not shipping any waste to the site, only what you actually need. And now you install this single-family house maybe in a day, 
a large building, maybe in a week or two, that has the other consequence that your interruption of traffic is now much, much shorter and your neighbor's gonna like you because he doesn't have the construction noise for years beside them. So these are, all together is the very simple answer why in countries with higher energy efficiency bylaws and code requirements, you will never see framing on site. It's always prefab. And there's another reason. As I mentioned earlier, we want to build taller and larger buildings. It doesn't matter if that's 10 floors in Australia, 16 floors in Canada, 18 floors in Norway. We figured out the structural design, how to use wood in a much larger context. And we want to use wood because of the low embodied energy. But we have to have prefabrication. You can't build these buildings on site. We need prefabrication to be faster, cost efficient and safe. And while you're at it, it would be very logical to increase the thickness of your envelope to make these buildings truly energy efficient. So bottom line, to build more environmentally friendly, we have to be more energy efficient, we need thicker envelopes, that means we have to go for prefabrication, because after all, our goal is to heat our kids' bedroom with two candles. <laughs>